So today we will talk about nature. How can nature be a topic of interest to disciplines that concern themselves with the study of culture? From the moment we reflect on nature, speak about it, represent it in one way or another, we attribute meaning to it. We enter into a relationship with it. Nature in art and in the visual media always has an interpretive aspect. Even when an artist paints what is called nature, with great precision, the depiction is still an interpretation. It presupposes a conception that nature is essentially what it outwardly appears to be, and that capturing its essence objectively is possible. Naturalism, which claims to offer a true picture of nature, is an ideology. Today I would like to show you how man's relationship to nature has changed and how this change is reflected in art, but also inversely, how artistic visual representations have impacted our relationship to nature. We will be concerning ourselves primarily with landscape painting and marginally with nature studies of plants and animals. But just what is landscape? There is nothing self-evident about perceiving nature as landscape. Landscape is a specific dispositive or conceptual apparatus within which one tries to comprehend nature. This presupposes an aesthetic relationship to nature. In her book Projektion und Imagination, die niederländische Landschaft der frühen Neuzeit im Diskurs von Geografie und Malerei, the art historian Tanja Michalski writes, and I quote, Landscape is a culturally coded concept of nature with a horizon of meaning on which numerous forms of historical discourse make their appearance. Among the most significant of these being not only aesthetics, religion and natural science, but also national identity and politics, end of quote. Landscape is not something that simply exists as such. It is always connected with human experience. It is something that is seen and constituted as landscape. A human being, an individual, a member of society, or as an artist or other observer, perceives the land, the world, nature as landscape. Landscape comes into being where the world of physical objects, the individual and society all intersect. The word landscape, Landschaft, is first attested in German in the 9th century, where it meant basically the quality of a large settled era. It was only in the 15th century that the German term began to be used in an aesthetic sense. And the first attested, attested use of the English word landscape is only in 1603. Early stages of an aesthetic approach to nature can be found in the cultures of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. In antiquity, at least in Roman art, there existed such a thing as landscape painting. Undoubtedly in Greece as well, although no examples have survived. 
Our knowledge of landscape painting in Greek art is based solely on written records. But it's for sure that in Greece there had been a landscape uh, art, but there's practically nothing left. The landscapes are mostly bucolic scenes featuring herdsmen with their cattle or flock shown in a gentle atmospheric perspective that is painted in casual brush strokes. Or, as you see here, um, in the Villa Livia, we have a room and the whole room is painted like this. So if you stand in this room, you know, it gives you the feeling as you being in a garden. Or you have this uh, kind of landscapes uh, with this uh, bucolic scenes. And um, you see that this is painted with a kind of an absorbing atmosphere, but it's not actual a perspective at work. You, we call this uh, loco, locus amenus in Latin, that means a pleasant place. This form of landscape painting was lost in the Middle Ages. In medieval art, there is no landscape painting per se. Nature is not perceived as space, nor is it taken in by the viewer as aesthetic composition. Culture in this era is to a great extent defined by the church. The production of art takes place in the monastic context. In religious art, scenes are not depicted in the here and now, not in the real world. They are detached from the terrestrial world, detached from time and space. What I show you as, a, as an example is from an Atonian book illustration. And you can see that everything is uh, flat and plain and you have no third dimension, no room and no landscape at all. It's just a golden background and you have just pieces, uh, motives like trees, which are more symbolically placed. I show you another example. It's later, it's uh, from the early 13th century but it's a Carmina Burana. And here you see a certain degree of observation of nature on a small scale. The arrangement, however, is plain art. The depicted scene <coughs> has been transformed into an ornamental composition. It's a kind of a pass pro toto, a part taken for the whole, as if these were symbols for nature. And what is typical, of course, it does, that it is a profane manuscript. Just a brief marginal remark. During the Middle Ages, a time when there was no real landscape painting in Europe, landscape painting was flourishing in China. Here I give you just two examples from this fantastic uh, landscape painting in China in a time where in Europe you had no landscape painting whatsoever. In European painting, we find the earliest beginning in the frescoes done by Giotto around 1306 for the Arena Chapel in Padua. And, and it can be generally said of Giotto's work that it signaled the beginning of early modern painting. A precondition for the emergence of landscape painting was the conceptualization of the third dimension, the effort to create the illusion, if only rudimentarily, of three-dimensional space. You see that in these two examples, landscape supports a narrative it still serves solely to highlight the characters and the action that is taking place. So you see the resurrection of Lazarus, you see that the hill is going up 
with the whole uh, figure group. And on the other side, on the right side, this dream of Joseph with the angel flying down. So the, 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 the rock is going down to Joseph. <clears throat> Then a decisive turn. Ambrogio Lorenzetti's mural paintings, done for the Sala della Pace in Siena's Palazzo Publico, these frescoes are allegories of good and bad government. Um, you see, what you see here is actually the utopia of a good city government, actually in my last lecture, with, with, uh, which you will not hear anymore, but will be on YouTube, I will talk about this from the point of view of utopia. And there, peace and justice prevail. Craftsmen, trades and commerce thrive. Uh, you have an allegorical scene, and then you have a city, and then you have a landscape. This conception of a harmonious society presupposes a country to which peace has been brought. The land itself, nature, is seen completely from the perspective of the people's needs. The land is worked by farmers. The fruits of the farmer's labor are brought to the city so that the people can be nourished. The land, consequently, is shown completely cultivated. The people are seen doing all the various kinds of work that has to be done. This is a composite picture that embraces all the seasons of the year. So if ever you are in Siena, you really have to go and to look at this because it's a, it's a fantastic fresco. It's a fact worth noting that at this very time, the early humanist Petrarch undertook, as a first in history, to climb to the top of a high mountain. In the year 1336, Petrarch ascended Mont Ventoux, a mountain with an elevation of almost 2,000 meters. This is about 6,000 feet in the region of Avignon. He recorded his impressions. Hesitation at first, then enormous effort, then the indescribable experience of viewing the panorama from the mountain summit. The result of it all being a feeling of homesickness for Italy, because as you know, Petrarca came from Italy and had to live in France. He writes of delighting at the beauty of the sight before him, but also of a feeling of anxiety. I mean, you have to, you have to imagine what it meant, you know, for us it's, it's so normal to climb on a mountain and to look down, yes. We even are used to go by airplane and see the earth from above. But you, can you imagine what it meant for people who never went on top of mountains? So that was a real, <coughs> that was really a, a, an exciting experience. But he, he, he felt uh, funny and so he takes his Saint Augustine from his pocket and happens to open the book to the page where Augustine warns against allowing oneself to be taken in by the terrestrial beauty. But what Petrarca describes is an aesthetic experience. In doing so, he makes what he describes landscape. Joachim Ritt and Matthias Eberle Individuum and Lancia have given a more precise description of this process and have seen the connection between, on the one hand, man's distancing himself from nature as a result of the emergence of cities and, on the other hand, the perception of nature becoming an aesthetic experience. So 
in the moment where you have cities like Siena, Florence, etc., and, and people are living in cities and not only on the countryside, it, it gets possible to get an, an aesthetic feeling towards nature. Towards the close of the 14th century and the early 15th century, isolated examples of studies of nature can be found that are already very precise, especially studies of animals and plants. I show you examples by Grassi and uh, Pisanello. It's interesting to know that this new empirical attitude mm -hmm. towards the world manifests itself at first by venturing to render details. And the subjects are not human beings, but animals. The depiction of human figure particularly in biblical scenes, is still much more strongly influenced by an established tradition. An important role in the emergence of landscape art was played by what were known as the labors of the months, Monatsbilder, an illustration genre that harked back to antique calendar illustrations and which had begun to take shape in medieval cathedral art. Illumination and mural painting. Each of the 12 months of the year was represented by the kinds of labors that were typically associated with that month. In most cases, the depicted scenes were linked to the signs of the zodiac. A major example of this genre are the labels in the Book of Hours of the Duc de Berry, Les Trériches Heures du Duc de Berry, dated 1416 and painted by the brothers Hermann Paul and Jean Lindbergh. I show you here two examples. Nearly every landscape is depicted in the shadow as it were, of one of the chateaux belonging to the artist's aristocratic patron, the Duke of Berry. Actually, the Duke of Berry owned 16 castles. The land is in this way directly linked to the notion of dominion. But at the same time, it is tied in with a yearly cycle of the seasons and in each case given its proper place within the general cosmic order. It is labor that connects man to nature. Nature is perceived from the perspective of its connection to man. What is of central importance is nature's utility to man. Shortly afterwards, a decisive step is taken towards what can genuinely be called landscape painting. The Badebash scenes in the prayer book known as the Turin Millen Hours, actually attributed to van Eyck, Jan van Eyck or um, his surroundings, the most probable date for the work is 1417. We can compare these illuminations with those of the Trerisch Oeur. You see, it's, it's almost at the same time, but you can see the enormous step that has been taken here. Of course, it's not, a, it's not an illustration of a labor of a month, but it's a, um, it's a biblical scene. But the important thing is how it is conceived. You see, the horizon has been lowered. The relationship between the painted figures and their surrounding has changed. The figures are now smaller and an effort has been made to integrate them. But what is particularly significant is that the components of the landscape are no longer treated merely as a function of the theme or motive here, 
Spatial attention has also been paid to the formal ways in which this can all be rendered. <clears throat> For example, the use of color. The mountains become blue in the background. There is a reflection on the water surface. The specific atmosphere, the light, the quality of the air, the death or distance, everything can actually be felt. And then comes the Gent Altar piece by Jan van Eyck. And there you see very close observation of nature, of individual plants and trees. Plants can be identified botanically and then another painting by Jan van Eyck, the Madonna of Chancellor Roland, who has, you have now the death of perspective. And you have indoor and outdoor. Here the two figures who are seen looking into the distant landscape constitute a reflection on the new specifically aesthetic relationship to nature emerging in the art of painting. You see the, the two little figures on the balcony looking into the landscape and one. Perhaps one can think one is the artist himself and the viewer. <clears throat> Shortly afterwards, in 1444, Konrad Witz, a German painter who had almost certainly been to the Netherlands, painted the miraculous drought of fishes. So for the first time, we see a detail of a real landscape. It's actually on the lake of Geneva. Of course, it doesn't look like this now because they are all houses, etc. But it, at that time, it really looked exactly like this. And perhaps you notice also the reflection on the water surface. <clears throat> it was Albrecht Dürer who took the new empirical relationship to nature a considerable step further. I show you the great piece of turf in German, das große Rasenstück. This painting evinces a genuinely scientific interest in nature and remarkably close observation of a selected piece of nature. Here, the underlying conception is that one recognizes nature for what it truly is when one observes it closely. So again, you must imagine what this means. You know, for us it means we are so used to this, but you have to imagine after the long time, the centuries of middle age, the first time where people are willing to observe nature precisely. But do you know, also painted watercolor landscapes. Landscapes, however, that he did not consider to be works in their own right, but rather studies for later paintings. Shortly after the year 1500, Albrecht Altdorf produced the first graphic works featuring landscape scenes in the strict sense of the term effect that indicates that the clientele for this genre had begun to exist. So you see, this is a graphic work, and there's nothing, there's not a biblical, not a mythological theme, it's just a piece of landscape. So it shows that people were interested to have uh, pieces of art showing just landscape. <coughs> The 16th century saw a significant further evolution of landscape painting, not only in Germany and the Netherlands, but also in Italy. 
1485, Giovanni Bellini, drawing on the nature mysticism of St. Francis, created his vision of the stigmatization of St. Francis. In the painting, Francis seems to be receiving his stigmata from the tree that is bending down towards him. This is an almost pantheistic conception of nature. <coughs> Giorgione and Titian will soon follow with landscapes of their creation. These are landscapes that present a utopia of pure nature a utopia in which man lives peacefully in harmony with nature. An example is a painting entitled Fetch on Petra, Pastoral Concert. Painted around 1510, begun by Giorgione and very probably finished by Titian. A musician from the city is seen sitting with a shepherd surrounded by a magnificent landscape. They are flanked by two female figures whose nakedness identifies them as nymphs, nymphs or perhaps allegories. Thus, real characters, as it were, have been combined here with mythical characters. The entire scene is a combination of the Christian conception of paradise and that of ancient Arcadia, as celebrated by Sanazaro in his poem Arcadia, written in 1485, a work in which the author draws on the poetry of Virgil and Theocrit. In fact, Jean Petre, it becomes manifest that depiction of landscapes inherently contain a utopian potential, an implicit expression of man's persistent desire to be at one with nature, a condition that in itself is a kind of paradise. We also see in the painting just how this potential is conveyed. <clears throat> The evolution, <coughs> the evolution of 16th century landscape painting in the Netherlands should also be considered otherwise and solely from an artistic point of view. This was a time during which momentous events occurred, events that significantly altered man's perception of space nature, the world, the universe. There was to begin with the discovery of America, which created an awareness of the existence of a new world, the existence of another culture. People's spatial perception of the world changed. Then came the Copernican revolution, the realization that the earth was not the center of the universe, but revolved around the sun. De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium Libri first appeared in print in 1543, the year of Copernicus' death. Copernicus' discovery was subsequently supported and further developed by research carried out by Galileo Galilei and Johannes Kepler. The heliocentric understanding of the universe contradicted not only the ancient Ptolemaic conception of the world, but also and especially the Christian notion of the creation. Indeed, it is a known fact that the church reacted to these discoveries 
with all the severity that could have been expected. Galileo's writings were banned and he was placed under arrest for the last 11 years of his life. It was only by recounting his findings that he was able to escape the punishment of death. What we can observe here is a paradigmatic change from a theological understanding of the world to a world viewed based on the natural sciences and one which, of course, took time to gain wide acceptance. <clears throat> the fledgling natural sciences, in particular astronomy and geography, permanently altered man's view of the world. Since Nicolas of Cusa and Giordano Bruno, the concept of an infinite universe had become established as a theoretical premise. Due to the awareness of a real extension of space and due to the expansion of trade, the very real need for geography and cartography also grew. In art, this new view of the world found expression in what eventually came to be referred to in German as Weltlandschaft, world landscape. A new type of composition that was developed in the early 16th century, especially in the Netherlands. What was fundamentally taking place here was nothing less than an endeavor to discover and describe the world and to measure its extent. The works that Patinia produced around 1520 revolve in essence around the idea of expressing pictorially the notion of an infinite world, its unfathomable vastness, and its diversity. It is an effort to grasp and represent the world in the sense of universe, the world of the story of the creation, the world seen as a place where the history of mankind has unfolded and continues to unfold. What we also see in the work of Patinia is an attempt to reconcile the new spatial perception of the world with the Christian history of salvation. So what you see here is really very interesting because it combines everything. On the one hand, you see the Christian conception of paradise and hell. But then comes the ancient, the ancient theme of Haron taking the soul, you see in the boat. <clears throat> and then comes this completely new uh, experience of landscape and nature and the universe. This conception will be taken further by various artists in the second quarter of the 16th century, he is again Patinia, such artists as Herimet de Blaise, for example. You see again uh, here St. John preaching, and you see this wild uh, landscape with so many very, very different things to see. Peter Bruegel the Elder, who significantly contributed to the development of landscape painting, also follows in this tradition. He seems depicting the times of the year, draw on the labors of the months of book illumination. I, I show you the Grimani breviary containing miniature scenes by Simon Benning and Gerard Hohenwalds. What is fundamentally new in the work of Bruegel, however, is the change of medium. It's no longer manuscript illumination, but panel painting. The corollary to that change being the release of the subject matter itself from its traditional feudal, Christian, 
and cosmic context. Broil achieves this by means of diagonal composition. Here again, we have to do with world landscape, Weltlandschaft, an attempt to bring together in one picture the world in its entirety and its various manifestations. What is being expressed is diversity, but also contingency, heterogeneity. Broide is the first to succeed in creating an overall atmosphere, a harmonization of colors. The composition is no longer divided into the three chromatic zones, foreground, green, middle ground, brown, background, blue. In the scene depicted by Bruegel, we are able actually to feel the specific atmosphere. Here the people are an integral part of nature. What is being evoked is an individual spatial experience, an experience that is in fact nothing less than somatic, even for today's viewer. The artist has tried to bring together in one picture all the various facets of life. On the right, we see a country in and people coming out of it. In the foreground, peasants are busy cutting and bundling branches of trees, an activity that is traditionally associated with the month of February. To the right of this group, a few young people enjoying some wafers something that is typically eaten during the Mardi Gras Carnival. Next to these festive activities, however, we see in the background details or events of quite another nature. Ships that have capsized or run aground in the storm. Shipwrecked people along the right bank of the river. I'm not sure whether you can see it, but you can go to the museum because we are very lucky to have uh, five of these Bruegel pictures in Vienna, and then you can see it in the background. The peaceful village in the left foreground contrasts with a dramatic background. As is so often the case with Bruegel, joie de vivre and daily human activities are shown alongside tragic events, life and death side by side. The graphic structure of the leafless tree branches and the clouds in the sky have been beautifully rendered by the painter. To towards the end of the 16th century, various experts of landscape painting are further developed. On the one hand, panoramic landscapes. I show you an example being from Gilles van Falkenburg. Uh, or you see um, the, also that travel becomes a significant factor, a factor that is due first of all to the expansion of trade relations but also to the flow of refugees resulting from the religious war. And you see this uh, with uh, Joseph de Mompa, to name one artist managed to capture this aspect. But at the opposite pole from the sweeping panoramas are close view landscapes, especially wooden or forest landscapes landscapes in which the dangerous, impenetrable nature of the woods or forests are evoked. And this is very typical for Gilles van Konigslow. He always made these kind of uh, forest landscapes. The mysterious becomes an aesthetic experience. And this is precisely the inversion of the panoramic landscape, which however, in quite a different way, also conceals many things. 
in the Netherlands and most notably in Haarlem. The early 17th century sees the production of rather and spectacular, and spectacular details of landscape. <clears throat> In most cases, these are small segments of landscapes or details rather than grand panoramic views. Chromatically, the use of hues of brown creates an aesthetic harmony of a unified character. This coloration, however, also renders quite felicitous the hazy atmosphere the humidity, the environment of the dunes, the water. This chromatic scene and the loose brushwork combine to evoke the material quality of the land, sand, water, moist air, but also the material quality of the painted surface itself. The banality of the landscape detail the commonplace nature of the subject chosen only heightens the impression of a real landscape. The viewer completely forgets any notion of construct. Dunes are a typical batch feature. And pictures of dunes undoubtedly contributed to the emergence of a feeling of national unity. Um, it is somewhat difficult to speak of a nation here. The Netherlands at this time consisted in fact of specific cities and provinces, and these only gradually merged together, a process to which the pictorial representations of landscape certainly contributed. <clears throat> In addition to dunes, canals also play an important role. One has to realize that it was only thanks to the construction of canals, the arduous work of draining land, and especially the power supplied by windmills, that buildable, arable, and fertile land was able to be reclaimed from the sea. In the Netherlands, the numerous canals and their regularly scheduled ferry traffic count among the greatest achievements of the 17th century. The pictorial representations with which we are concerned here do indeed depict nature but it is nature that to a very great extent exists only thanks to human labor. Labor that once constituted a part of the development of agriculture and considerably contributed to the pride of the Netherlands. Thus, it is very much the case that landscape paintings can also have a political meaning. The thematic evolution departs from narrative subject matter culminating in the depiction of, for example, a water course itself under a big sky. I show you an example by Salomon uh, Roysdale. Uh, it's not Jacob Roysdale, but Salomon mm -hmm. Roysdale. And you see here, there is no longer any anecdotal aspect. The entire landscape is presented as seen from the water. The viewer has the impression of a peaceful, ordered life in connection with the water. This corresponds to the general evolution of landscape painting. People, human activities have an acquired secondary importance. The main theme is increasingly the representation of nature per se.
In order better to comprehend the characteristic traits of landscape painting in its phase of maturity around the middle of this century, we can compare landscape by Jacob van Roestel with one by Peter Bruegel the Elder. Jacob Isaacson van Roestel, one of the most significant Dutch landscape painter, was born in Harlem around 1628 and was also buried in Harlem in 1682. During his lifetime, however, he also worked in Amsterdam and traveled extensively in the Netherlands. We can compare Bruegel's painting entitled The Return of the Herd, 1565, with Royster's view of Alkmaar, painted around 1617. In Bruegel's painting, we see what is still the cosmic conception of a Weltlandschaft, world landscape. In the painting by Royster, the landscape is apparently one that was actually seen by an individual. Bruegel depicts presence, bringing the herd home. These are people who are tending to their labors outdoors. Royster's human figures are tiny. They are strollers, travelers, people who are spending their leisure time outdoors. These people surrounded by nature are not doing work. They are taking a stroll. The two paintings differ greatly with regard to their overall composition. Bruegel's composition, as always, is di diagonal. Paths, rivers, trees direct the viewer's eye deep into the picture. We can still clearly distinguish a foreground from a middle ground and a background. In the case of Royster, what we have before us is a unified space from foreground to background one coherent space, a space that we, the viewers, can actually imagine crossing on foot. The horizon is low. Most of the surface of the painting is taken up by a dramatically cloudy sky. The motives or objects in Bruegel's painting determine in each case the color or colors used meadows, crops, open fields. With Bruegel, this is no longer the case. The structure defining element is light. Light and shadow, which, just a minute. Sorry. Light and shadow, which in turn are determined by the weather and the clouds. They give their entire composition its structure. This makes it possible to look not only at space, but also at time in different way. In Bruegel's painting, the notion of seasons of the year is still very much present. The atmosphere is the overall atmosphere of the season and man is still seen as an integral part of the eternal yearly circle. With Royce this is not so. Here it is a change that is taking place here and now that is of interest. Not the internal cycle, but constant change. And here again is a notion of contingency. The weather conditions at a given moment in time determine the appearance of the landscape. And at any moment, those conditions and how that landscape looks can change. If we are to comprehend this new way of looking at time, space, light, and the relation between man and nature, 
we must consider aesthetic representation at this time in the context of the sciences that we are rapidly developing. One might, one might first mention optics, a science that, thanks to Kepler, Descartes and others, was beginning to acquire first rank importance. Both the telescope and the microscope were invented in the Netherlands in this period. And the center of lens grinding was also in the Netherlands. Light and things having to do with light were no longer treated solely as a divine category. Light was now seen as a natural phenomenon. Light, the refraction of light, the relationship between light and colors, all of this was becoming the subject of intense study. Descartes, who significantly had been living in Amsterdam since the 1630s, proved that colors were not only properties of objects, but were dependent on light. Colors change according to how how light falls on them. And Reusel clearly took this into account in his work. Representing a unified, coherent space, identifying its characteristics, describing, measuring, and delimiting it is the aim of geography and cartography. And here again, the Netherlands were the center of cartography. What explains this? In the course of the 17th century, the Netherlands managed to become the foremost European commercial power with the greatest number of colonies. In what was now the Dutch Republic, it had become not only possible but essential to map the world. This world that was to be crisscrossed by ships, this world that has to be ruled. In 1983, Svetlana Alpers, in her book, The Art of Describing, postulated the interrelation between Dutch landscape painting and cartography. Somewhat later, in 2014, this thesis was reiterated and stated in greater detail in an exhibition catalogue entitled Mapping Spaces, Networks of Knowledge in 17th Century Landscape Painting, edited by Ulrike Gehring and Peter Weibel. The authors of this volume see a close and direct threefold connection between science, especially cartography, technology, including specifics of warfare technology, and Dutch landscape painting. Here I personally agree with the assertions put forth by Tanja Michalski in this respect. Michalski, while recognizing this connection, expresses also the differences between art and science. <clears throat> the subjective experience of taking in a landscape the emotional aspects that go along with that experience, the various meanings that can be attached to one's perception of a landscape, all of this in this form belongs to the domain of art. Painted artworks precisely because they seek to render three-dimensional space and death by the use of perspective clearly distinguish themselves from the two-dimensionality of maps, not to mention the aesthetic aspect of painted works, 
which is motivated otherwise than by concerns for mathematical measurement or potential appropriation. To questions like these, art has different answers than those proposed by science. The authors of the exhibition catalog introduce a Flemish artist, Peter Snyers, whose work in fact does combine pictorial and scientific representation. In Snyers' war panoramas, which he produced significantly for the Spanish crown, we see a combination of artistic aspiration and knowledge of technology ballistics, defense construction, and geography. What is astonishing in the early, is the early day, the early 1620s and 30s. This same period saw the development of panorama landscape painting. In the work of another Dutch landscape painter, Philips Koning, we see certain distinctive similarity that he shares with Roysdale. Koning, born in Amsterdam, lived from 1619 to 1688 and very probably studied under Rembrandt. There exist very few works painted by him. Those that are known are mostly landscapes. His landscape painting always depicts vast flat landscape seen from a slight elevation. The distinctive objects and in most cases the dramatic clouds that are characteristic of Roysdale's landscapes are lacking here. Cunning's brushwork is not meticulously precise as Roysdale's typically is, at least in his treatment of foregrounds. <clears throat> Koning's painting technique has a dappled aspect. Only with some effort, we are able to make out specific details. These details, however, are always subordinate to the overall impression. The aesthetic experience is one of vastness. In the work of Koning, it is again the contrast of light and shadow often caused by cloud cover that provides structure to the picture. Although the work of Conning gives the impression of being absolutely true to nature, by closer observation one notices that his compositions are in fact made up of patches of color of course, Conning's paintings are no less structures than Roysdale's. Conning's landscapes are not cartographic or objective descriptions. Due to the vastness of the scenes depicted and the tiny scale of the human figures, these landscapes inspire awe, and at the same time they evoke a mood of absorption. These landscapes also simply show the city dwellers enjoyment of nature. In order to highlight the specifically Dutch character of these paintings, I would like to show you for comparison a work by an Italian painter, Annibale Caracci. This work was produced at the beginning of the 17th century. Here one should by no means see an attempt to reproduce a concrete landscape that was actually seen. Rather, it is a heroic, idealized landscape. In the view of the Italian painters and art theorists, Giovanni Lomazzo and Federico Zuccaro, both of whom in this respect followed the thinking of the Italian art theorist Leon Battista Alberti and the ancient Greek painter Xerxes. An idealized landscape should not be based 
on anything seen by chance, but must be composed of ideal elements. It must be in keeping with notions of decorum, and it must convey an exalted atmosphere. One could in fact say that it was in the work of the Netherlandish painting that the impression of fortuity, the impression of things seen by chance, actually emerged. What is in essence being expressed in these paintings, in the Netherlands paintings, is not so much the notion of a utopian landscape as a new conceptualization of the land itself, the lands of the Netherlands. The painters depict the flatness of their Dutch landscapes, landscapes that have been made exploitable, landscapes, however, from which the arduous labor that was necessary to create them has visually been deleted. Also, the fruit of this labor is clearly visible. I show you here from a the windmill at Wyk by Durstede. There were many, many windmills, just as there are many wind turbines today. But it was actually not very often that windmills were depicted. And when they were, it was in most cases just one alone, a something of an emblem. The windmill at Wyk has been monumentalized here. The tiny human figure standing near it only enhanced the monumental character. In actual fact, however, what seems to be monumentalized here is a typical Dutch landscape. The painter also seems to be proposing an image with which people can identify, an image of their own country. In, the Dutch saw the heroic less in the classical motives of antiquity than in their own physical environment such as that depicted by Albert Koy, the painter from Dordrecht. Notice in particular also the light, and you see it has no, there is no um, pieces of antiquity, ruins or something like this, cows, which is really not a heroic motive, but the way how it is painted gives some kind of a monumental atmosphere. Jakob van Roystel took interest in very different kinds of landscapes, close views of massive trees, panoramic landscapes, seascapes, forest landscapes, with torrential waterfalls. I show you one of these here. In the case of this latter type of landscape, he was influenced by another painter, Allard van Everdingen, who, unlike Roystel, had actually been in Norway. In Roystel's painting, you can see that the landscape which Roystel himself never saw is clearly one that he invented. So it looks like a real nature, but actually has never been there, and it's really an invention. One of the most original landscape artists was Hercules Segers. He was born in Haarlem around 1590 and died in Amsterdam 1683. He produced, above all, graphic works featuring landscapes, <coughs> many of which he colored. Only 10 paintings by him are known. He uses the technique of etching less as a means of multiple reproduction than a as a way to achieve certain aesthetic effects. He has a dappling technique. He, his work has a very abstract aspect. It is often the case that only overall structures can be recognized. Structures that, on the whole, have a very modern appearance. 
nature is conceived and conveyed a structure that encompasses everything, but that cannot be truly grasped. <coughs> Holland owed everything to the sea. Its fishing industry, especially salted herring, but also its colonial empire, the wealth that was drawn from that empire, Holland's expanded trade relations, its naval fleet, its power. There were many artists who depicted the sea and every possible aspect of the sea. Its magnificence, its beauty, its immensity, the enchantment of the light, the air, the atmosphere, but also the perils of the sea. For many people, the sea had meant death. Depictions of storm at sea and ships being smashed to pieces can be read precisely as such. But one can also see in these images a metaphor for life's hardships and tragedies. <coughs> the sea and ships are frequent metaphors, and as such they have a very real origin. This, for example, in the discourse of love, and in the discourse about love, the sea Ships, shipwrecks or rescue at sea are often resorted to in order to evoke good and bad fortune in love. Landscape painting also very definitely has political implications. Beginning in the 1620s, the Netherlands or to be more exact, the Dutch West India Company succeeded in conquering parts of Brazil that had previously been occupied by the Portuguese. From 1624 to 1654, the northeastern Brazilian province of Pernambuco was Dutch in comparison with the period of Spain's Portugal rule, this was a short period of time, and the territory in question was relatively small. Nevertheless, the Dutch presence very significantly contributed to shaping the historical picture of Brazil. As Governor General John Morris of Nassau, governed the colony of the behest of the Dutch West India Company. He had brought with him, in addition to a cartographer and a physician, a painter, namely Franz Post, a landscape painter from Haarlem. Today, still the paintings done by Post are seen as documentation of life and places actually witnessed and seen rather than as constructions reflecting attitudes connecting with colonial exquisition. And in actual fact, unlike other early modern portrayals of America, Post's paintings neither stress the exotic nor exaggerate the foreign aspect to the point of making them seem bizarre or fantastic. <clears throat> Here the view into the distance is very deep. The fort, also visible, does not mar the natural landscape. I don't know whether you can even see it, it's on the right hill. <clears throat> The whole landscape gives the impression of being untouched. In the foreground, we see plant and an animal life depicted with meticulous scientific precision. 
The topography is also rendered with precision. However, viewing a foreign natural landscape in this way becomes an aesthetic experience, one in which what is in fact conquest is conveyed and perceived in the guise of visual discovery. The riverbank in the foreground was enemy territory, but the way the picture has been painted suggests, suggests rather the contrary. An untouched, peaceful landscape, which remains to be explored by sophisticated Europeans. The land was seized from the Portuguese through armed struggle. The land was massively transformed by the clearing of woodland in order to create sugar and tobacco plantations. Slaves were imported from Africa to do the work on the plantations. The specific places the posts depicts are always connected with the Dutch conquest. But the pictures show neither the forced displacement of the indigenous population nor the Portuguese, not to mention the slaves and their situation. These pictures give an impression of uninhabited landscapes into which the black people have been organically incorporated. Later in the Netherlands, Post continued to paint only Brazilian landscapes, even at the time when the colonized territories no longer belong to the Netherlands. The Dutch have no particular need for portrayals of heroes and rulers. Their claim to power is demonstrated rather by representations of regions of land and of the fruits born by the land. People will talk about the objective representation of things that are foreign. People will talk about topographic precision being a function of pictorial representation and about a function that consists in reproducing sites seen in true to life fashion. And in this way, people avoid talking about the actual strategy behind these pictures. In these pictorial representations, a form of political discourse makes itself felt, one that suggests a utopian notion of an administration that takes place in a political vacuum. It is a form of discourse that presents the appropriation of land as an appropriation of nature itself, thus making the process seem legitimate. This is a fundamental element of colonial thinking. The pictures seem so beautiful, so harmless, but they conceal the violent truth. Here again, we see a phenomenon that we already discussed in a previous lecture, the lecture dealing with gender constructs. Namely, art can make the visible Invisible? Yes, art can make the visible actually invisible. It can conceal people in relationships. What we can also see again is that pictorial representations, art, can only be understood and judged in context. Sometimes pictures that seem harmless are anything but that precisely because this apparent harmlessness conceals and suppresses violent truths. During Nazism, for example, there was a demand not only for pictures glorifying the military and war, but also for precisely such landscapes and farming scenes. For the National Socialists, however, such pictorial representations had quite a different significance. Whereas Franz Post in the 17th century was motivated by among other things, genuine curiosity, <clears throat> a thirst for knowledge about the newly 
discovered region about its plants and its animals, which had never yet been seen. The National Socialists were motivated by a determination to make specific things seem harmless, to suppress them and to deny them. But let's come back to the 17th century, this time to Nicolaus Poussin. He was originally from France, but spent the greater part of his life in Italy, specifically in Rome. He had no desire to work for the French royal court. He made a point of distancing himself from academic classicism. <clears throat> One might refer to him as a chief exponent of a classical form of landscape that held sway well into the 18th century. I show you as an example Le Calme. Here is an Arcadian landscape. In the foreground, we see a ghost, a goat herd tending his goats. He is leaning on his staff with his back turned to us. The dog is sitting on the ground. The goats are motionless. On the opposite side of the water, a flock of sheep and a herd of cows arranged in isocephalic fashion, that means the heads all shown at the same level, are seen moving practically parallel to the water's edge. The picture is framed on the left and the right by trees standing erect. In the middle ground is a pond in which the castle-like structure in the background is reflected. High rock formations, due to their coloration and shapes, seem to transition into clouds. Clouds that then complete the composition at the top. This is a world of symmetry, clarity, proper balance, calm, and harmony. <clears throat> a world of serenity. The birth, <clears throat> the birth of Bacchus dated around 1650. Bacchus was conveyed by the god Mercury to nymphs who were to care for him. In the right foreground of the painting lies Narcissus dead. Next to him the nymph Echo is seen bewailing him. Across from them on the left is a group of nymphs who are looking and pointing in the direction of the joyful event that is taking place. Sitting on a hillock almost hidden by trees is Pan flay, playing his flute. He has nestled so clo closely up against the trunks of the trees that he is hardly visible. Mercury is pointing towards the skies. We are surrounded by clouds. Zeus is sitting on his throne, accompanied by his cupbearer and the eagle. The scene actually being treated here is a natural life cycle, seen as a law of nature, a law to which everyone, including the gods, is subject, a law that is understood as an in ineluctable integral whole birth and death, joy and pain. The individuality of the various figures in the painting has not been highlighted. They are altogether discrete and blend in with nature, which is seen as that which overarches everything. Poussin's landscapes are like textile fabrics, like tapestries, everything is interwoven and interconnected. With Poussin in the 17th century, nature could still have a utopian dimension, and art embodied that utopia. A century later, at the close of the 18th century, at the time of the Enlightenment, this view of nature began to teeter. On the one hand, Jean-Jacques Rousseau asserted that man's salvation was to be found in nature, 
but at the same time he rejected the sciences and the arts, considering that they distanced man from pure nature. He considered them decadent. In Rousseau's view, nature was goodness itself, the original goodness that has been lost. In 1767, Denise Diderot was the first to maintain the city inhabitants hung pictures of landscapes on the walls of their saloons to compensate for the loss of nature in their lives. However, Diderot did not see this only in a negative light. He also saw that art could have an enlightening and corrective function. At this same time, Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon, in his, in his Histoire Naturelle, wrote that nature was abominable and, as the phrase goes, on its last legs. He held that nature was dangerous for human beings and that it was God's intention that man should conquer nature, civilize it, improve it. There was no going back to nature. The Industrial Revolution had made that impossible. Moreover, man's relationship to nature had changed as a result of the development of the natural sciences, in particular geography, geology, and meteorology. No one translated this idea into pictorial form as impressively as Kaspar, as Kaspar David Friedrich. In contrast to classical landscape painting from Poussin and others, in Friedrich's work, there is no obvious balancing of foreground, middle ground, and background. There is no particular weight in the middle of the composition. The painted scene is not self-contained. The picture is left open-ended on both sides. Caspar David Friedrich is rather in the tradition of 17th century Dutch landscape painting. In his painting, Monk by the Sea, we saw, we talked about it the last time, about melancholy, there is no particular subject to speak of here. Only sand, the sea, the sky, and this minuscule monk. Here nature serves as a projection space for the human psyche. Friedrich himself said that the painter should paint not what he sees before him, but what he sees inside him. The sculptor David Danger, after paying a visit to Friedrich in his atelier, wrote, I quote, everything is life and suffering in nature. And this man sees everything in relation to himself. He sees himself embodied in all the great crises of nature. Here we are dealing with a feeling of solitude and desolation. All of this has to do not only with the loss of feeling of being closely connected to nature. It also reflects the atmosphere in Germany after the French Revolution. The atmosphere at the time when efforts were being made to restore the old order in Europe, a time of political desperation. Nature came to be seen as a place of refuge and as a metaphor for human life. <clears throat> in the paintings of C.D. Friedrich, man is no longer integrated into nature. Man is not shown at work in nature, and man is certainly not shown casually strolling surrounded by nature. Man is standing before nature, observing it. In Friedrich landscapes, the figures viewed from behind offer the viewer the opportunity to identify with them. They are doing precisely what the viewer is doing. They are gazing. Friedrich realized that man's relationship to nature had become an aesthetic relation.
I show you as a comparison a painting by a Biedermeyer painter, Edwin Ludwig Richter. It's all more or less the same time, but you see a completely different attitude. Here we are deluded into thinking that everything is easygoing and harmonious. Richter withdraws into nature nostalgia. Friedrich confronts the issue of the breach in man's relationship to nature. Friedrich portrays the yearning, the feeling of loss. Richter denies the loss. Richter was critical of Friedrich's work. Allow me to quote him, they, the paintings, unsettle us, and then suddenly make the string snap and leave us to deal with our feeling of irritation. Friedrich shows a transition that takes place in nature. He shows the fragile, the fragmentary. He looks down into the abyss and out at the inscrutable. As you can see, depictions of landscape are never mimetic reproductions of landscapes that have actually been seen. Very diverse themes of a fundamental nature are treated in pictorial representation of landscapes. Man's relationship to God, his relation to nature, his place within the universe, his attitude towards himself. Landscapes, the works of art, are bound up with social change, with the development of the productive forces, with advances in technology, but also with the discourse of various scientific fields, such as geography, geology, and meteorology. <clears throat> in 1803, the English meteorologist Luke Howard published an essay on the differentiation of nomenclature of types of clouds, establishing a classification that consisted of cirrus, cumulus, and stratus clouds. This contributed to arousing enormous general interest in meteorology. And John Constable, as a painter, he took up these uh, scientific uh, experiences and made an enormous, and he made many, many paintings of clouds. And on the reverse sides, he wrote exactly, you know, the time and the, the situation uh, of the weather and of the wind. So you see, landscape have to do with how we experience space. With the advent of railways, the experience of high speed changed people's perception of space, which found itself becoming perception of time. As you see here with William Turner and Turner painting, entitled Rain, Steam, and Speed. This focus how time or moments of time I experienced was further intensified by the Impressionists, by Monet, for example. With the Impressionists, what was of essence was not the actual subject, but rather the impression of a specific moment. So time took over the role of space. Indeed, there is no longer special death in these paintings. The pattern of patches of dapples of color throughout the picture makes it difficult for the viewer to have an impression of spatial death. At the beginning of the 20th century, endeavors to comprehend the inner laws of nature led to a total renouncement to attempts to imitate nature. This, of course, had also to do with the beginning of photography. Montreal will then become totally abstract. <clears throat> he first goes out of nature, but then um, he goes further and further. And uh, this has also to do, of course, with scientific approaches to nature. But what, at what it, it ends in is uh, in a total abstract way. 
which is quite far away from nature. Today, given the massive destruction of nature and the ecological catastrophe that is taking place, we find ourselves having to become more conscious of the responsibility we have towards nature. Today, as at other times in the past, the ways in which art is able to grapple with the notions of nature and landscape constitute, I think, a topic of essential significance. Okay.